Grant Anderson is co-founded Paragon back in 1993. From the time of the company's inception until the fall of 2014, he was VP of Engineering and Chief Engineer. He was responsible for the design and implementation of not only many of Paragon's technical achievements, but also its processes of engineering innovation in a stepped approach of requirements, design, build, test, and delivery. This process has been cited by many customers as unique, disciplined, and highly productive. As his background includes not only technical, but financial and managerial training as well, he has held diverse positions at Paragon, including treasurer secretary, chief financial officer, VP of operations, chief operating officer, and director of manufacturing. He is a recognized, he's recognized as a leader in the life support and extreme environments field. Mr. Anderson has led systems and conceptual designs of multiple spacecraft under contract to Lockheed Martin, Boeing, Sierra Nevada, SpaceX, NASA, and Inspiration Mars, and many others. Uh, he holds two degrees from Stanford in the mechanical engineering uh, and aerospace engineering uh, and is a registered professional engineer in the state of California. Uh, he doesn't mention it in here, but he is one of the old guard of International Space University. And I've been following his work for at least 10-ish years, maybe more than that. So uh, I, I consider him to be one of the, uh, one of the very most interesting uh, environmental controls and uh, life support people out there. So uh, great to have you here, Grant. Really looking forward to this conversation, sir. First off, uh, again, thank you everybody here. And, and I really appreciate going after Ben. And, and I was the one who wrote the thing about saying, hey, it's good to see some underground stuff. Uh, I do have a slide on that that's maybe a little controversial. I also gave a, a talk at Mars University um, and also consulted to the design, uh, the Museum of Design in, um, in London about how pretty much all habitats on the surface of either the moon or Mars are wrong, and, and I'll explain that in a little bit. So first of all, uh, where am I going with this uh, with this little uh, presentation? One, a little bit of brief background, not about me, the, that bio was generous and long. Um, but a little bit about where I've been and, and why I speak about this stuff. I'm going to do a little bit of a definition of, in, of what we call ECLIS, which is environmental control and life support, and what that means to get everybody framed on that. And then a little bit of a very one short chart on what's the state of long duration life support. And in this case, I'm talking about space uh, long duration life support. And then um, I'll talk about four specific challenges we have on the moon. And most of them have been touched on this morning and stuff, dust, uh, power, um, the radiation environments um, and stuff of that nature. Um, and with a lot of diving into dust, cause I, I'm, I'm, uh, I, I say that the world is divided into two types of people. Those who think dust is, can be handled and the other ones who think dust is uh, the equivalent of chicken little and the sky is falling. And I'll admit I kind of tend towards the chicken little side and I'll explain why. And then I've actually got a little special topic that has some history to it, which is all about growing plants on the moon, uh, which is uh, which which it actually is it's a, in the history of Paragon for a long time. So first of all, what's Paragon in our history? We have been involved in every single human spaceflight program since 1999. Uh, the architecture for both the Dragon vehicle and the and the uh, CST-100 Boeing vehicle are both Paragon's environmental control architecture. We provided hardware to the CST-100 that's going to be flying on July 30th, as well as um, we, well, essentially helped uh, uh, Elon found SpaceX and did the architectural design for the Dragon vehicle. And I'll talk a little bit about more of that in the future. Um, up in the upper left there, I do want to say one thing about my history, the, that picture of the soul of the space station there. I worked at Lockheed right before I started Paragon. Paragon started in 1993, and I was actually the uh, what they called the design project lead, which is essentially the head uh, design engineer for the solar arrays for space station. And again, we've been working on everything from inflatables, not, and again, I'll get a little bit more into that technology. So a little bit to give you a sort of the background of, of where I'm coming from, because one of the things that Paragon does is full environmental control systems. So we have to think about everything. How, to, how much power do we take? Uh, what type of resources we need? What are we gonna use? What are we gonna throw away? What are you gonna, re gonna recycle? And all that's very important for what we're talking about today. 
So this is my first chart. And if some of you, if you see me talk other places, I do use this chart a lot. I call ECLIS, Environmental Control and Life Support, the forgotten subsystem. Why is that? Well, it's because rockets and smoke and fire are really, really exciting. Um, but uh, in the human spaceflight world, the payload um, is what's important. And, uh, and so I often start with this and say, hey, is this a human payload? And I, I, for, I uh, ask um, uh, for forgiveness for a male-centric uh, thing here, but it is a fairly iconic uh, uh, picture from Leonardo da Vinci, the virtuous man. Um, but in reality, this is not the human payload. I get up in front of even NASA people and say, is this the payload? They say, yes. And I say, no, because this is really the human payload. It's a human surrounded by environmental control system. You will never, ever launch a human into space without an environmental control system around them. It's really bad publicity and a short and ugly mission. So, so very often, you got to think about the fact that everything that's been human specific design for space has this involved in it. And, and uh, if you wanna see some people at Marshall Space Flight Center turn a little green, tell them that in the human spaceflight world, NASA is actually a, a bio biology organization with a little bit of rocket technology thrown in. Uh, that gets usually a few, few winces from people at NASA, but, but in reality, that's true. The Saturn V, the shuttle, anything that was purposely designed and not a derivative from, a, from an ICBM or something has had limitations put on it by the human payload, either acceleration or deceleration when you're coming back and everything else. Um, and you got to take that in, in kind. But it's also why Paragon exists. We love designing around humans and biology. It really makes things interesting. I could have designed spacecraft, you know, the communication spacecraft and stuff my whole life. To me, that's a robot and it's a robot in a really cool place, but it's still just a robot. And, and really what makes the engineering exciting for me is having to design around humans. And then I put this one in here because I, I, this is kind of a summary. It's a little bit overblown and has a lot of things imploding for one thing, but um, this is of course from the Martian. We're talking about the, the, the moon here, but it, it still applies about what happens if your life support system goes south. Um, and that's very, very important. And while the moon is a lot closer to Earth and you can escape to Earth in, in most scenarios, it's a two or three day journey. Um, in reality, it's still a problem. It's got to be reliable. It's got to be maintainable. And it's got to work all the time. There is very little uh, lead time between when you your, your life support system fails and when you need to really do something about it. In the life support world, we have what's called the rule of threes, three seconds, three minutes, three days, and three weeks. And what that is, is three seconds is about how long you can last when you lose pressure, or otherwise you embolize and essentially drown in your own uh, uh, lungs from the burst blood vessels and stuff. In three uh, hour, or three minutes is about how long you can last without oxygen, it's how long you can hold your breath. Uh, three days is about how long you can last without water, and three weeks is about how long you can last without food. And we always keep that in mind when we're looking at, the, again, the maintainability. How do, fast can you fix something, as well as the other uh, risks and effects of a life support system. So now getting into a little more detail to get everybody oriented about what is a life support system. In general, in the U.S., we define it as in the six different areas. Um, I, I, I emphasize the U.S. because some space agencies, Russia and stuff, have a little bit of a different mix in what they include in life support. But really what it comes down to is these six, human accommodations. So the clothing, one of the, one of the things that's really interesting, clothing is a real problem. Uh, when, you're, when you're sitting at a moon base for six months, how often do you change your underwear is really the, is sort of the very crude way of thinking about it. But how often do you get it clean? Do you clean it? Do you just throw it away? Um, but other accommodations too, uh, such as the hygiene, how do you wash, how often do you wash, what type of ex exercise equipment you need. I know somebody mentioned a little while ago about, um, uh, about the fact that 1.6G, we don't know if we even even reproduce. Paragon actually was the first company to ever have a, an animal re reproduced through multiple generations in microgravity uh, back in 1996. Uh, we did some experiments on the shuttle and then Mir. But uh, so we know it can be done, uh, but there are some very pertinent issues to that. Water management. Water is a big thing. Again, that's that you can go with wild water for about three days. That involves everything from making water and then collecting water from waste, either urine or, or and actually if your feces has a fair amount of, of water in it to 
of the hygiene, the cleaning, uh, what we call gray water. How do you refine that, reprocess it, make it drinkable for the humans on board um, and keep that recycling going? Or you can always just bring tanks of clean water from, from Earth. But even with the, the plunging or lowering of the launch cost, that's still considered somewhat impractical if you can um, have a device that will, that will clean the water um, and, and doesn't weigh too much to get off the ground here. Air management. Uh, it's interesting. I really should say thermal management. Well, no, I'll say air management. I'll go with air management first. The air management is really keeping a breathable atmosphere. That, that includes full pressure. Uh, uh, the, the underground systems that Ben uh, said are one of the things they've got to be is fairly airtight. You can't leak it to everywhere, but you've got to maintain the pressure, of course. But also then once you're in the environment, you've got to supply the right amount of partial pressure of oxygen, which is depending on what physiology is talking about, somewhere from 2.4, 2.8 PSI, all the way up to 3 point so, or so, uh, 3.4 or so of, of oxygen. You got to provide that. But we also produce a lot of waste. We produce CO2, of course, when we're breathing, but we also put out also a whole bunch of other chemi chemicals, gases like methane and some hydrogen sulfides and stuff like that. And you can't let them build up. You've got to actually be able to clean them out. Some you have to clean out continuously. Some you can batch clean out every three days or four days and not get above what we call in our industry smack levels, which are the minimum levels that they want in order to not affect human physiology. Crew waste management is big. It's also the one that makes all of the kids giggle when I give presentations at schools. This is, of course, collecting the poop and the peep, as they say, or the feces and the urine in the, in the more sophisticated world, um, and making sure that you handle those, whether you recycle them, again, maybe extract the water, uh, definitely pre-treat them, hold them. If you're going to hold urine in a tank for any period of time, you probably have to sterilize it or put in a biocide. And that is a really complex thing. And in fact, I've seen some pictures, uh, not necessarily at this conference, about the inside of the SpaceX vehicle. And one of the questions I always have for Elon is, where are the bathrooms? And, and they seem to not show up in a lot of the, uh, of the art. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, food management is big, big too. Uh, frankly, going to the moon and back, given the transportation and stuff, uh, I think um, you know, it's going to be the equivalent of power bars and, and Gatorade to some degree in the beginning. Um, we, I get a lot of questions about, well, what about raising your food? What about growing your own food? Well, um, that works, except it takes a lot of weight. It doesn't matter if it's aerophonic or hydroponic or maybe even growing uh, plants in soil. Uh, you've still got to have all the material there. When you grow a plant, only a certain amounts are edible and stuff like that. So I do see a lot of stuff having to do with just packaged food, but that's a problem. Packaging is waste. And what do you do with it? How do you deal with it? How do you minimize it over time? And then finally, thermal control. And the reason I kind of oscillated between air management and thermal control, really, you've got to keep the air right. And then the next thing that astronauts worry about is, am I at the right temperature? Humans are really picky. We want to be 70 plus or minus two degrees. Usually, um, uh, there's a difference between people and their metabolism. Anybody who's uh, has a spouse in the same house, then we keep, you keep fighting over the thermostat, you understand that. But in the world, especially of the moon, where you have a very harsh, hot environment in, during the day and a very cold environment at night, how do you get that uh, stuff out? How do you get the, the waste out um, to, uh, to the, uh, sorry, I've just got some windows popping up on the chats. How do you get that, um, how do you, how do you get that heat collected from the inside where it's usually getting too warm because we produce heat. Humans are a, low, a, a bright light bulb. We put out about 100 to 120 watts when we're not exercising, um, but also all of your equipment, all your electronic equipment. How do you get that heat into something to transport it to the outside and get it rejected through usually a radiator? There are some ways to do it with waste products like a sublimator, but I'll, uh, I'm not going to get into that right now. So there's your overview. You now know more about environmental control than probably 99% of the human population at this point. But I know that this crowd is much more sophisticated, so I hope I didn't bore you to tears. Um, and then finally, what is the long duration of history in space? None of it's on the surface of anywhere. The, the, we don't have bases on the moon yet. We don't have bases on Mars. We've done all of our life support for long duration in vehicles, whether it's Skylab, Mir, ISS, uh, Tiangong, and, um, I'm, and I forget, I'm sorry, this may be a little bit old. I think there's the new name of, of another uh, system up there with the Chinese. 
the, there's some interesting things about that. The, they've all been designed for Leo. So they, they all, if they break down, you're essentially 30 minutes away from escaping and getting back to the ground if you have a severe, act, a severe issue. But not only that, if you have something breaking down like a pump or a, a fan or, a, um, or something like that, you can always call up for another one. And, you know, depending on manifests and, and time to build and stuff, you're three to nine months away from getting a replacement. And of course, there are a few replacements on, on, the, on the vehicle themselves. The interesting thing is they're packaged in what are called ORUs, orbital replacement units. And the philosophy for orbital replacement units for LEO is pretty big. You can have 250 pound pump packages and stuff like that. That's not going to work when you're on the moon. You're not going to carry three extra 250 pound pumps with you and pump packages, which include controllers and everything else. Uh, you're going to want to repair at a smaller level. I won't get into that, but one of the bigger arguments going on in environmental control right now, and it's generally in general with long duration, is what is how much you're designing for reliability and maintainability, and how much is redundancy, and how do you balance that so you don't have to lift so much stuff and, and store and have a volume for so much stuff. So getting now into the lunar part of the world, what are the critical issues on lunar life support? And I really, I have these four, I'm sure everybody will come up with a few more, but it's really, uh, I, I really do like the, the moon is a harsh mistress uh, by Robert A. Heinlein, because it is, it's a really harsh place to be. Um, and the first one, of course, that everybody thinks about is lunar day night cycle, the two weeks of sun and two weeks of dark and how that works. The associated temperature swings associated with that from minus 200 Fahrenheit to plus 200 Fahrenheit. And I will say that's, that's a very simplistic, that's what we call a flat plate um, uh, steady state temperature. That means if you have a theoretical flat plate on the, on the surface, what, what temperatures would get to, and it's like minus 20 to plus plus 200, minus 200 to plus 200. It actually is very much different from that. You can shade them, you can do other things, you can shade from the ground and all that. But that's that's one issue. Um, the other one is, um, sorry, I've got to, there we go. Uh, the other one is dust. And, and I will say unequivocally, there is nothing like it on earth. And you get a lot of people that talk simulants and simulants for dust. None of them are close. The morphology, the the um, the the amount of I think Ben mentioned the stickiness and and everything else about dust. Um, you know, dust is something that's been exposed for four billion years at a tend in the negative twelve tor or so. Sorry, that was supposed to be uh, superscripted. Um, it's it's it does not exist. And the dirty little secret about the samples coming back from the moon is. All of them that were put in the sample boxes were essentially at Houston ambient pressure by the time they got to Houston. The seals leaked. Why? Because of the dust. There were some more hermetically sealed items. And I've talked to the curator. It was a little while ago, about a decade ago, I talked to the curator down at JSC. They were sitting about 10 to the negative 6 tor. Well, that still sounds like a really good vacuum, but that's six orders of magnitude higher pressure than what they were at when they were collected. So you can't even take that no matter how careful and use that for tests really. And this whole thing of being bombarded by meteorites and micrometeoroids and how it worked, Ben mentioned about, we think that the dust is, is thicker at the surface and as you get lower, um, it will get different to the morphology and you'll go to larger structures. The one true thing about it is we, we tried to mitigate dust on Apollo and nothing worked. And I'll talk more about that. Radiation is a big thing. There's really no protection for those on the surface. And there's really a very little warning too. There's a few hours of warning if you do a radiation event in which you can scramble to a protective area. Um, but when you're out there, you're still getting pretty decent amounts of dosage, you know, a lot much more than on the Mars, not because Mars is farther away, but also Mars has a sensible atmosphere that does do some shielding. Of course, we enjoy that here in, in, on Earth. And finally, the other thing that's a critical issue is the transport and resupply time. What do you want to bring with you and what do you have to find? How do you live off the land with I IRSU? So let's go into... Oh, let's see. There we go. There we go. So oh, naturally, um, there we are. So let's talk about thermal control first a little bit. One of the things that's sort of untalked about a little bit is how cryogenic storage is very hard. Um, the Apollo lunar module had hypergolics, which were essentially 
room temperature, temperature storage of, of fuels that they can rely on. The minute you mix them together, they, they combust and you end up with a rocket. Uh, you may note that the most of the uh, HLS, the human lander system candidates, and the one I show here on the lower left is the ostensible winner of SpaceX. They have cryogenic oxygen in them. How do you store cryogenic oxygen when the flat plate temperature is 200 Fahrenheit? How do you store it for any period of time? That's a big problem. Um, so, so you're gonna you're gonna see, and and one of the things is it's not just absorbing direct from the sun, but the sun heats the surface, and the surface then re-radiates um, at, at very very succinct uh, wavelengths towards your vehicle, you're going to be cooking pretty hard. And, and I'll admit one of the issues with that, the HLS design is, is there on the lower left is exactly what is the thermal control component of that vehicle. And I'm, I'm very curious about that. I don't have enough insight into it at this point. The other thing about the long days and long nights and then semi-thermal control related is that for 14 days, you don't have sun. And so Really, the, I see a lot of concepts with solar arrays. That means you also have to have 14 days worth of battery storage, or you go into some hibernation capability, which means you need less battery storage, but you still need enough power to get through the night. And frankly, uh, I don't see a way we will have a, a viable human base on the moon or Mars until we plunk down a medium-sized nuclear reactor. And there's been some recent announcement in the last month or two about development of nuclear reactors, but I'm really surprised that we haven't been pushing on that really hard. We need a space transportable, um, landable nuclear reactor power supply, and it's probably one of the first things should land on the surface. And the moon, of course, you don't have to worry about dust storms like on Mars, but you do have to worry about 14 days of, of, um, of night. On the, on the Mars, of course, you have dust storms that can last two months and you will get no solar power out of that. It's actually a black sky at that point. So I, I really do not see any way uh, to, to, to have a viable colony without a nuclear reactor in there. Um, and then the other thing that's a little more technical is that uh, Paragon builds radiators. We're building radiators for the um, for the uh, the Dream Chaser vehicle, and it uses a special technology that we've registered as a trademark called XRAD. Uh, we've patented this, and really, what it is is an extruded radiator that we can build very cheap and uh, and consistently and very flexible. We can get a ch design change a week and a half before a critical design review and still build the radiator on schedule. Um, and so getting those radiators are out, out on the surface somewhere where they can see deep space, see that four Kelvin back in, background environment is really important. Um, the other thing is they have to be micrometeoroid um, uh, compatible. You know, you're gonna have micrometeoroids hitting the surface. The, the, you can't puncture a, 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 a tube in any way, shape or form. Uh, and that's one thing also that is, is, a, is, is a feature of the X-Ride technology. And I put these uh, episodal tank uh, propellant tanks. We are doing this for NASA. We're building, um, we're designing and building these. These are cryo tanks that are actually inflatable and they have a certain amount of insulative properties, which are really cool. That's by the way, one of our solutions for cryo tanks. But again, to, to Ben's point and somebody commented in the chat, it's be a really good to be able to find a lava tube, which I talk about later, and inflate a vehicle. We have another program that I don't highlight here called House, which actually is a ready-made inflatable um, uh, module. It's mainly made for zero gravity because you can have multiple floors, but it's also very good for the moon. And being able to inflate and use that, it's you know collapsible, transportable, and everything else. So our solutions are the shielding the, the sh shielded radiators that we talked about here. And I, I mentioned something called Celsius EPT. I talk about here. Celsius is a little more sensitive, but it's really another um, highly highly efficient um, multi-layer insulation to some degree that will allow cryo tanks to last weeks on the, on, on, the moon, Mars, on the moon surface. And I can't show anything about that because it's too proprietary, but Celsius is a program. You, you can actually go look it up on the NASA websites because we've done some uh, public domain work on that. So that's really thermal control. Um, dust, I could spend an hour and a half just talking about dust. Um, 
uh, you'll notice the picture I have there. I, I can't remember which astronaut this is on the moon, but I give a close up a little bit of that suit and look how gray it is. That was a bright white suit with a, something called a beta cloth external layer. And that's after two, three days on the moon. And every single astronaut, I think, except one fell down at some part. Well, except for the two, I don't think Neil and, and Buzz did. They fell down when they started doing real science on the moon and, and having to traverse and be there multiple days. And dust is really, really interesting on the moon. I, I, I've said before, there's no way to duplicate it on Earth. There's no way to bake out and get yourself down to where there's no interstitial gases between the layers of the dust in, within the nooks and crannies of the dust. The morphology of the sharpness of the dust is really interesting. Uh, in fact, uh, astronauts very often, and when they well, always when they came back from the moon, uh, when they were there for multiple days, so they went in and got out of their suits and back in, ended up with dust embedded in their fingernails that didn't grow out for two or three months. Um, and they also had a, a dust embedded in their arms at the where the where they bent. And that means that dust went through the external micrometeoroid, the beta, beta layer, which is a, a thermal layer, the micrometeoroid shield, which is under that, and the air bladder and into their skin. It's very sharp, very small. I will tell you right now, seals will fail. Um, if you ask the astronauts, uh, the, the Apollo, you know, I know Harris, Harrison Schmidt said to me, it wasn't that we were gonna run out of oxygen why we had to get off the lunar surface is the suits were falling apart. The zippers, the, the, um, the, the cloth systems were highly, highly affected by the dust. You may remember there's a picture of Harrison Smith throwing a hammer away. That hammer used to have a rubber handle on the outside, a rubber covering on the handle. It totally disappeared in three days. You can go down to Ace Hardware. You used to be able to buy a, a hammer with a like kind of a black rubber handle. It took three days for it to totally wipe that, that out. Um, and then also the dust in, introduced in the spacecraft that's very, very impertinent to life support because we have to clean that dust out of the air. We have to be able to pull it out because we, we're not sure, but it could be toxic in, in decent quantities. Toxicity is always about um, dosage, not, not the toxicity per se. Uh, and then also it's a, probably at least harmful to the lungs. So you gotta be able to pull it out. So we've done many studies here at Paragon of, of how to do HEPA filters, how to clean them, how to back clean them so that you can get the dust back out. But we're always suffering from the fact that we have to use the simulant here on the earth. So what's the solution to this? It's really to test, test, and test some more on this. And the, what you see in the lower right there is a device that we designed, proposed to NASA to put on the lunar surface that really you put regolith on the right side, you stir it up and you have various, uh, in this case, 10 shafts of different sealants and try, of seals for rotating shafts and try out these seals to see if they deteriorate over time. We really want to get this on the surface. And I will say that with the CLIPS program, the commercial lunar payload system, where they're going to be landing um, un, uncrewed uh, vehicles on the surface for experiments, if every single one doesn't have at least one dust experiment, I think we're, we're probably barking up the wrong tree. We need to really go and test this because there is nowhere else you can test this. We have these things called TRL levels, the technology readiness levels. And one of the things is tested in the relevant environment, I think is uh, TRL seven. We can't get to, pat to seven on earth with lunar dust period. It doesn't matter. You've got to go to the moon and test it. So we should be landing things on the moon and testing them out. I'm really concerned that we're going to plunk a billion, billion and a half dollars with a habitat somehow on the moon, and it's going to be obsolete or at least non-functional within six months. So um, if, if I don't see seal tests and other wear tests associated with uh, lunar regolith on every single CLIPS flight that goes, I'm, I'm going to be a little bit disappointed. And by the way, this hasn't been accepted by NASA. We're trying to get it fly. If anybody is on this from NASA and says, hey, yeah, we really do need to fly this. We actually built this and ran it uh, for a little bit. It wasn't flight worthy, it was a ground version, but it was kind of cool. You would do it and each, each shaft was instrumented so you could see which ones were starting to get more wear and more resistance, more torque. And that would give you an idea of the seals. And you could test 10 different types of material or you could test five of two different materials to compare them or however you want. Um, finally, um, the second to the last is radiation. Um, radiation, uh, I put this thing up in the upper right with a big cross around it. 
when you see, and, and my apologies to some of the habitat and, and uh, presentations uh, earlier this morning, but whenever I see a glass dome, I, 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 I kind of sigh. You're not gonna have a glass dome on the surface of, of the moon, period. <laughs> there's, uh, there's, at least within this case, with something growing in it, something in it. Will you have a protected dome, maybe inflated for certain experiments? Sure. But in Nix's case, these implications are always, they're part of the habitat, especially if you see trees growing in them. In reality, the radiation is gonna drive you underground there's, or you're going to bury yourself a little bit like you kind of see on the left-hand side of that, of that uh, picture in the upper right. And how do you do that? Digging is one thing. The other one is there are a lot of ready-made things called lava tubes. We know they're on the moon. We've seen them. Uh, the picture on the left is a little bit of, of the rill system, which uh, linear rills may be, as a matter of fact, collapsed lava tubes. But uh, the one on the right is really cool. That's a picture from a, uh, from a satellite around the moon of what we call skylights. It's the, where the, the theory is that the, the ceiling of the lava tube has fallen in and you ended up with this. So we really advocate going, finding these lava tubes, getting in, using Ben's system of some sort of iron and structural thing to, to, uh, to, to make sure they don't collapse in on you and stuff, I think is a very good idea. We have gone down the way of uh, doing inflatable habitats on that as long as, of course, when you inflate, you don't pop the system. Um, but you really need to get underground or bury yourself in a few meters of regolith in order to keep yourself away from the radiation problem. Um, and then finally, um, the living off the land. What do you bring from Earth and what do you have? I, I really liked, um, I can't remember uh, who, who said it, but the fact that uh, with ULA offering to, to, to buy um, propellant grade oxygen, hydrogen for two or three thousand uh, dollars a kilogram. Heck, just transport it from the from the surface of the earth is maybe a way to do it. But Paragon's been working hard on how do you recover water in general. The upper right there is a picture of actually a device that's now on the space station called the brine processor assembly that recovers 98 percent of the water out of urine. But the problem is, how do you get the water in the first place? You can bring a certain amount from Earth, but as many scientific uh, conclusions have come up, there is a lot of water on the surface. Some of it is in the, the, the permanently shadowed craters, but they're finding it's almost everywhere now. But having water like that and then having usable water is a very different thing. And Paragon is working actually on two different concepts. Uh, and I'm, I've got a, if you're wondering, if you're trying to read that lower left schematic, I've got a blow up on the next one uh, to give you a little closer uh, view of it all. Um, so uh, anyway, but, but so we're using something called IHOP, which is in-situ hydrogen oxygen production. And it's a way to take the volatiles that come off with the water, clean out those volatiles from the water, purify the water and make it at least breathable grade oxygen out of that, um, or in some cases, hydrogen and oxygen uh, um, uh, propellants. And yeah, so then one of the aspects of our IHOP technology is if a part called Icicle, which is in situ collector of ice in a cold lunar environment, would actually use selective freezing out to be able to purify your, your water and make it, um, make it again something you can use. And I think one thing I said about uh, this going back is there's no chemical industry to refine products on the, on the surface of the moon. And very often I see this as why don't we just you know, make make something, make our our solar cells on on the moon or Mars or whatever, and it takes a huge train of billion dollar industries to make the products to make those systems um, on Earth, let alone. So when you get up to the moon, you don't have those systems. I promised, and I'm going to conclude with this. Um, can you grow a plant on the moon? And the, the unequivocal goal is yes, you can for a short period of time. The story behind this is that Paragon was asked by JPL to come up with a system for, for growing plants on Mars using Martian regolith. And, and I, I specifically kind of blurred the picture up above because it has a few proprietary things on it, but up in the upper left. But we really developed about something the size of a half a loaf of bread that could condition the soil, water the soil. We created a way to create seed cards that you see that now, actually, you can get a coaster that has seeds embedded in it so you can go plant it in your garden, it'll grow. It was that concept. Um, and we were looking at growing an Arabidopsis plant. Well, that was interesting because when Elon Musk sold his shares of, of um, 
um, PayPal, he wanted to go do something cool on Mars, and one of them was raising a plant. So he actually paid Paragon to start designing and building the, the, the plant system. And the lower left one there is actually the concept we came up with, which is a sort of a pedal thing that opens up. It's got solar power. It can selectively open and close the, uh, the, the window into it. The window is actually made out of an aerogel. Um, just to say that this wasn't just pretty pictures and a PowerPoint design, the, the lower middle one actually shows the uh, breadboard concept of actually something of doing this. Of course, all the mechanical stuff of cooling and air control and stuff is behind in the blue cabinet behind you, but it gives you the same idea. It was doable. And then we also did something called the, the Lunar Oasis program. Um, and I had a picture of that and I frankly just forgot to put it on this, I realized. But uh, the I can actually blow it up maybe, but this here is actually a picture of a real piece, piece of hardware that we've uh, very amateurishly stuck on something. But the idea is you could land it on the ground and, and do that. Um, and then uh, that's, that's pretty much what I had to say. And, and uh, I'm almost running out of time. So I'm gonna hand it back to Michael and I hope I have some time for a question. Sorry, I went a little longer than I thought. Don't don't apologize. It's fascinating. I mean, it it is, uh, you know, your slide where it's kind of you know the 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 forgotten subsystem. I, I don't know how people forget it, right? I mean, I'm not I'm not doing this to send uh, more robots to the moon and Mars, right? I mean, I think there should be robots on the moon and Mars, but I'm doing this to get people there. Uh, and, and, you know, I think plants are a, a necessary precursor, um, uh, just because we're going to kill them. So might as well kill something that's not going to fight back. <laughs> um, but, uh, no, it, I think it's, I think it's fascinating. I think it's an underappreciated uh, science. It is, uh, vastly harder than is usually perceived. Um, and given, uh, you know, the slide that you had that has, I don't know, seven, eight different human related missions, uh, um, uh, earlier, I, I just feel it's really remarkable what, what y'all accomplished and what you're continuing to do. Um, given that it's really, really hard, um, you know, there's some comments about, you know, uh, could we grow th things on the moon to inspire children? Um, given that it's really hard, what is the simplest thing that could go to the moon the soonest? Um, and I'm going to guess it's plants, but you know, if you've got if you got something else, if it's if it's microbes, if it's something even sim what what's the simplest thing that could happen that we could show? Well, I mean, what we could do is duplicate. Paragon put the per first commercial payload on space station. So we were the first ones ever to buy time to go actually up to space station. We did it through the Russian side because NASA wouldn't play ball at the time. Right. And we actually put up a, an aquatic bio biological system. It was about the you know, about this big, if you can see my hand. Yeah. And we put that up on the Russian module and it was actually Velcroed under a light because it needed light to live. And the fun thing about that is it was an educational project. We actually built simulators of that and distributed them to Russian schools. And then after we launched, I actually went down the route to the Russian schools and explained the experiment. And they could talk to the Russian astronauts and, and, and grow something in theirs and, and compare it to what was going on there. So you know, that we have readily made. Paragon has, has done three and actually our longest biological mission that last was 18 months on the space station. Wow. And, and that actually did not die or end. It was they uh, they decided they wanted the space, so they put it in the progress vehicle and burned it up. And okay. there's a whole other story behind that I can't get into. But Fair enough. Um, you know, Manny's asking, are there really no ideas on mitigating lunar dust? You know, I, I had never heard the stories you just told us a minute ago about disintegrating hammers and disintegrating spacesuits. I mean, that would have been a bad headline. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, you know, are there are there are there solutions to this? 
Well, um, uh, kind of, as I pointed out, there are candidate solutions. Um, however, we don't know if they work. And in fact, Paragon has an existing contract we're executing. We just won it last month with NASA for how to clean dust off of radiators. But one of the another little dirty little secret about Apollo is they got on and they tried to hammer the first few um, core testers into the surface and they didn't go anywhere in as far as they would. And it was because they kind of tested them in a, you know, a sandbox on, on Earth. And the, again, morphology of lunar dust, of the dust on the ground, but there's a lot of interstitial gases and it's kind of greasy, so to speak. You know, it's sl slippery compared to what you find on the moon. And, and, uh, and so they, what they did is they spent about $17 million of, I think, then year dollars in the 60s of mitigation things. They had John Young in a in a vacuum chamber trying to dust dust off of a off of a, the radiator. The the um, actually the the one cool thing about this picture here is the um, the backside of this radiator. And actually, let me get to dust here. The the backside of this um, of this lunar rover had the batteries. The batteries had a uh, a radiator on top. Not really. It was passive, but that got dirty. And the radiator started to overheat. So they were trying to figure out how to brush them off. So they were in there, actually, they tried bore bristle brushes, you know, the sort of type that you do to put on shaving cream. And they tried all that on the ground and said, okay, they got up onto the moon and tried it and none of them worked. Zero of them worked. Now, I've got a great graph that I didn't have time to put in here that shows the thermal response of these radiators. And they went up and it got hotter and hotter and hotter. They dusted them off and it went down in a sawtooth pattern, but it didn't go anywhere down, anywhere near what the original virgin material was. And then it went up even farther and then they dusted off and it came down even less. So essentially, they got more more time by dusting it off, but it kept sawtoothing up, and it was essentially going to fail within a few days. So that's what I meant about there were so many things that a short three day mission you could survive it, but if you get longer than that, you're not. So that's where I'm very pessimistic. But again, we have theorized uh, for one thing, like the seal material I talked about here. We think we've come up with a very good rotating seal material that will help mitigate lunar dust. I won't. It's proprietary what the material is, um, but We'll never know until we test it. And, and I'm very humble to say that I will do, I could do billions of dollars to testing on the ground and never know for sure if it's going to work until I get to the moon. Wow, that's spooky. Um, Ryan from the, uh, from the uh, one of the attendees uh, mentioned that China grew a plant on the moon, uh, Changi three or four, he believes. Uh, do you want to debunk that a little bit? Well, um, I frankly have not dived into it. Um, I didn't even hear about it until a month or so ago. Um, and uh, uh, I frankly, I, I shouldn't comment on it because I really just don't know anything. I would say that, um, did it germinate on the moon is the first question. If, if it you, did not. Yeah, and, and if it didn't germinate on the moon, you really don't know if you can grow something on the moon. Uh, you know, anybody, <laughs> my wife has the brownest thumb in the world. Thank God she's not listening. She can kill any plant and, but she can still get it home from the store and get it and get it set up in the house. And, you know, that's essentially all you did was take something from your store and, and set it up on the moon. That's not growing a plant on the moon. That, and and, uh, and uh, so it, it, that was the hardest part about that, um, that, uh, that thing I talked about with the, the, by the way, the, 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 the Mars one was supposed to go on the Mars 2001 lander, but the budget got cut. So the project got cut as it was the Mars 2001 lander and ended up auguring in any way. So it wouldn't have been done, but the hardest part was almost how to get the seeds to germinate. And, and we actually had the seeds germinate slightly above the soil because they have to get to a certain point before they can start getting their roots in or you're probably going to kill them before they're viable enough to go on. So, so yeah, I, I will say, I won't say a plant has grown in space on the lunar surface until it germinates and then grows. I, I will say it has not grown in space. Yeah. All right. Uh, we are moving on. Thank you so much for your, uh, your insights. Um, I have to admit uh, it is uh, somewhat humbling and somewhat discouraging, but we better know the problems in advance before we head there. So, well, and I don't want to come on as Debbie Downer, you know, no, 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 I get it. I get it. Yeah. No, this but is, it's just really hard. It's hard it's, to do this stuff. It's the stuff we have to deal with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Moving on.